Hello, my name is Elena Rijita. I'm a lecturer of Arab and Islamic studies at the University of Granada. In this section, I will introduce you another topic related to this of Europe and its others. Professor Bieber has already announced in his lecture the term Orientalism. This concept has been widely explored after it was coined by the Palestinian North American professor Edward Said in 1978. Basically, Orientalism is a collective depiction of the East that is related to Europe. More precisely, Orientalism arises from the asymmetric relationship that colonialism introduced in the interaction between Europe and the Eastern cultures. To demonstrate how it works, Said explored this consistent and coherent representation of the East through the European cultural production, the French painting of the 19th century, the literary works of mainly French and English authors, and the academic works of anthropologists or historians, among others. The set of features that Said identified in this variety of intellectual activities were sensuality, despotism, cruelty, wealth and honor. One important and enduring effect of Orientalism is how it also shapes the narrative of Europe. To be more precise, how it affects the representation of the European Islamic heritage. As displayed by Professor Dovile Jagninaide, Europe is difficult to explain as a geographical concept, but it is also elusive from the point of view of culture or civilization. If we observe Europe through these notions, we find constantly reconfigured historical narratives. After the Enlightenment, these narratives emphasize the Greco-Roman juridical and philosophical legacy, and also the Judeo-Christian tradition as foundational myths but they also obscure the complexity and mythical nature of this narrative. Let's observe first the representation of Jewish and Muslim legacies in today's narrative of Europe. Some notable contributions have emerged from the academic field regarding the importance of Muslims and Jews in the transmission of medieval knowledge. Greek and Arab scientific knowledge circulated naturally among Christian and Jewish circles in Europe during the Middle Ages. These processes of transmission, adaptation and innovation were made possible through the translation of Greek and Arabic texts into Latin, Hebrew and the European vernacular languages, as well as through the collaboration of scholars across religious affiliations. This was the case with the School of Translators established in the 13th century by the Castilian king Alphonse the Wise in Toledo, Spain. We should understand here translation in a creative sense. This implies that knowledge was being transferred and adapted to new contexts and frames of reference. Therefore, the translation of ancient traditions entails the Europeanization of knowledge that developed in another time and geography. Despite the recognition of the impact of Jewish culture on European history, which stems from a narrative of Judeo-Christian Europe, the interaction between Jewish and Muslim cultures in Southern and Eastern Europe and its following impact on intellectual traditions has been largely ignored. Failing to do so, this wishes the intertwinement and impact of the Muslim and Jewish traditions in Europe. This results in the consolidation of narratives of difference and enmity. To challenge this, let's focus on the paradigmatic example of the university, not only as a place of knowledge transmission, but also as a genuine European institution that emerged during the so-called medieval renaissance of the 12th century. A genealogical look at the transmission of scientific knowledge alongside the birth of early universities permits us, through the examination of textbooks that were used in medieval universities, to trace the journey of ideas from one language to another and from one knowledge tradition to another. This allows us to prove the existence of an intellectual exchange, multicultural and multilingual in nature, that form the very essence of the university. And this is not a mere episode in history. On the contrary, 
History provides an enormous number of crossroads, accounts of assimilation and re-elaboration of traditions, facts and ideas that contradict a univocal narrative. Alongside this inclusivity and exclusion of individuals and groups belonging to different communities, there is a hybrid space where art, ideas and worldviews reach across borders to break traditional religious binaries of Muslims versus Jews, of Muslims versus Christians, etc. From this perspective, there is a need to go beyond merely showing that the roots of Europe are in part Semitic, that is, Islamic and Jewish from a religious perspective, but they are also Arab and Hebrew from a linguistic and cultural viewpoint. To conclude this short introduction, what is more important about this legacy is to understand the historical processes through which various narratives exclude Muslims as part of Europe. Also, to reveal how the rhetoric of modernity obscures their role. This brings us back to Orientalism and the persistence of this representation inside Europe, which has also the effect of rejecting Islam as part of Europe. To complement my talk, I have selected two readings. The first one, by Professor Nilufer Gold, is from 2010 and focuses on the controversy of the minaret pan in Switzerland. Although the controversy dates back to more than a decade, you will see how essentially the terms of the debate remain very actual. In the second reading, Professor Nadia Fadel engages with a book by the French political scientist Olivier Roy entitled with the provoking question, Is Europe Christian? Fadil questions the very essence of this query by reframing it into the colonial history of Europe to point to a fundamental interrogation that is an answer in itself. Is Europe still white? Last but not least, you can also go deeper into the concept of Orientalism through this very useful introductory reading to the impact and enduring influence of Said Orientalism.